morning, and this is, <laughs> yeah, second in the series of my rawhide videos. However, I'm going to arrange this video in three parts. The first part is really telling everyone out there, support your, your magazine. In the primitive bow community, it's not like the hot rod community or the sports community with Sports Illustrated. We have one magazine, and we are relatively small. We are a small and powerful group. So please, go to the Primitive Archer magazine website, check it out, and if you are not subscribing to it thus far, make it part of your day. I'll just kind of run through here. It goes beyond just bows and arrows. We Primitive Archers, in this community, I keep pushing that, it's a place and not a thing, uh, go beyond just bows and arrows. Let's just cut through here, the hunting column, bows of the month, and let's see if I can find that. We bowed on the bow of the month, self bow and back bow. There is a regular featured column by, let's see here, uh, Patrick Blank on flint napping, um, Cave Chatter by Ryan Gillen. In this episode, he's talking about primitive hunting. How can I get into primitive hunting? And then, of course, Mark St. Louis. In this one, this is kind of fun, because I did a, a video or two or three or a thousand on the juniper cedar question. He's talking about cedar for bowwood and then discussing, you know, the juniper question if it has deep red heartwood. And there's me, the medicine man that did sweet grass in my first installment. This next one is a little more complex, but it's interesting, by the way. The Poet's Corner, and <clears throat> there's a fellow in here, aside from Mike Yancey and Mark St. Louis and Ryan Gill and everyone else, really impresses the heck out of me in his efforts that he expends in experimental archaeology. And this is about banner stones. You know, as far as dart throwers, most people call them atlatls, but atlatl is kind of a specific name um, that refers to these devices in a specific region, an Aztec name. And then, this is really cool, hold this up here, how to make bowls in containers out of wood using burning and scraping. And so, in conclusion, my friends, Support your magazine. Support your magazine. It's just like this place. We could not maintain and offer this to the public, this beautiful, beautiful preserve up here in northern Michigan on Little Traverse Bay, without support, financial support. And it's not charity. It is definitely not charity. It's supply and demand. You want something, and so you help support it. That is that for the Primitive Archer magazine in this episode of John Just Rambles Incessantly. Secondly, the paddle bows. I have my first three, the heavier ones, 50 pounds plus, and let me just peel this off. What I like about Deer Rawhide is it's, it's so variable. In this case, it looks like Mike the Man Yancey smoked it because it has this beautiful dark color and with my 12 strips that I received I matched it as best as possible color and thickness and this is just nice nice line bonding very well along the edges the handle not peeling up that's stuck down there um, this side a little wobble here you know but I trimmed it before and glued it down so that will clean up if I was to not use Helmsman Spar Urethane after I paint these, and if I wanted to go to a more primitive finish, I wouldn't even clean up those edges with sandpaper. I would just leave the natural texture of the wobbly line. However, because I'm going to be sealing it down, let's see what this one looks like, sealing it down with Helmsman Spar Urethane, I can most definitely, usually I roll it as I'm doing it, but I'm just going to strip this off. This one I use a little bit more glue on the edges than the other ones, so it's going to probably st stick to the bow a little bit with the tight bond. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Our, our music. I'm not going to do the other side because I don't want to hold you up too much because we all have 
places to go, people to meet, things to do. And I have no idea how the edge turned out in this one. Again, when you use gauze, yep, it's sticking a little bit, but this is definitely reusable for another bow. You're able to adjust how it lays on the bow because you can feel the edges. So if you use uneven pressure and you don't have a perfect alignment when you're wrapping it, it sloughs off to one side, you can correct it. That's what I like about gauze. And if I pull it straight out, I lessen the risk of, well, I've got, you know, some stickiness on here. But you lessen the risk of the gauze tearing up and not being usable for more than one ball. I mentioned in my earlier message that when you're sinew backing bows, the gauze does not stick at all. It just doesn't seem to stick to hide glue because it gels so fast. You don't have the same issue as you do a tight bond. Let's see here. Now each of these is an individual, not necessarily 100% production line. And so it didn't slough off. I don't see bare wood. That's good. Kind of goes over the edge there, which is not bad. That's that's nice. I'm going to clean it up because I'm going to bevel it. So you're not going to be able to see like the distinct line of where that stops and then the wood starts. This is kind of cool. little variation. That's not that it has air bubbles under there. It's stuck down. But the variations in rawhide are amazing. And sometimes rawhide is almost clear. And so that's good. The next step is just to let this dry for a while. I'm not going to work it for a day or two because I really want that type on the setup. It's possible that it's not 100% cured and so the rawhide might creep if I mess with it too much, you know, as it continues to shrink a little bit. So I'm just going to leave it. Okay, part three. Medicinal plants, very important. I am going to first start out saying that we are responsible for the maintenance of our own health. In this modern age, sometimes we relinquish control. It's like our health professionals have everything to do. We can do whatever we want. We can live off pizza and, um, and soft drinks, and that's not good because you're just asking for trouble. I live in a pharmacy, basically, a natural pharmacy. This strip between the drive and the fence very dry, very gravelly. So the plants, I didn't fight with it. We planted certain things and then they died off if they weren't able to survive and then other things came in. And so I've got blue vervain and monarda. On the other side of the fence there's a creek and that's where my stinging nettle patch is. And then it goes up here and I'm actually going to show you spikenard. I dug up a couple things here to get the roots. Uh, American spikenard and then I've got echinacea and yarrow and all, well, all sorts of stuff over there, varying things. So, the one thing that everyone needs to have is a French press. Now, it is true that if you have fatty acids, lipids, as it were, and those are usually found in seeds, the seed heads, the fatty acids are not water-soluble. And so, what, if you use a French press to make teas or infusions or decoctions, you're not going to get the advantages of the, the fatty acids. That's um, where tinctures come in, because tinctures use alcohol as a solvent. It's more effective to, revert, to remove the, the good compounds, although teas do help. And tinctures using alcohol as a solvent is necessary to get the lipids, the fatty acids, out of the plants. But what I have, and this is great, I've noticed that like um, some plants, it's listed, in, in its medicinal qualities, and might be the placebo effect, but some of these plants are actually very effective. Monarda, for one thing, and then, which has a pleasant flavor, I might add. And this, let me get a close up. Blue vervain. There we go. Vervain flowers and some leaves. Leaves. Vervain is good for a lot of things. A couple of the major ones, they, they list a whole bunch of possible um, health benefits beyond this, of course. But the ones I like is it's anti-parasitic. You know, if you happen to have worms, even this modern age, 
or other parasites, internal parasites, little things that are kind of hanging on, not helping, but just taking. Blue vervain is an effective antiparasitic. Maybe not anti-malarial and anti-protozoan like mullen might be, but there's a lot of little creepy creatures that live in us, and so blue vervain. I'm also going to add John's Recipe Corner. Little English lavender for flavor, because English lavender helps ease the. This is very pungent, very bitter. For flavor, and then also mullen, just because of its qualities as far as going above and beyond this for antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti um, protozoic, anti fungal, anti everything. It's bad. And so I'm going to make a, a combination of tea here. Now, I have been thinking that I'm going to eliminate coffee from my diet. I still like that stimulant. You know, I wake up and I want to, uh, I want to wake up. But there's other things we can use. Things that don't have that same coffee crash. And one of them, and I'm going to take pictures of this. Oh, blue vervain. Ver I actually use this because it's a great respiratory aid as far as the decongestion and, um, I've been having like issues, I believe I have allergies, and since I've been doing this, it's cleared up a lot. I'm a little draining here, but I'm not stuffy anymore. Um, it's just everything is loosening up. This stuff is effective, and it doesn't have to be over a course of weeks. Have like a French press full of blue vervain if you're congested and like <coughs> hacking stuff up. You'll see the difference better than mucinex and over-the-counter stuff and certainly a lot less expensive and I know where this came from. So I have my coffee substitute. This is chicory. This is a roadside weed and I don't I don't refer to weeds in a bad way because some of my favorite plants are weeds. Just like some of my favorite dogs are mutts. And this is uh, got that blue flower that you see. The, close up and then open up and then close up and open up throughout the day. Uh, the greens, nutritional. So I'm going to use the root, but I'm also going to use the greens. Very nutritious. You can make, they, they, them, can make a sweetener that's diabetic compatible. It contains berberines. There's all these fancy words I'm throwing out here. Anyway, Café du Monde, one of the finest coffees in the world, uses coffee and chicory root roasted chicory root to give it a good bitter flavor. This is a coffee substitute, this root. This is a small plant. I've got some monsters back there, but I decided just to dig up a small one. And you can see it's kind of carrot-like, um, a tap root, and it's got these little side things. When I roast it, I'm not even going to bother. I'm going to clean it off really good, but I'm not even going to bother to remove and, and try to clean off the, um, the bark, the covering from the roots. Just use the whole thing to maximize it chicory. I will blend this in my quest to make a coffee substitute with Aurelia racinosa, American spikenard. Now I'm doing this for you because if I waited another month or so, less than that, maybe three weeks, these are going to turn into beautiful deep red berries that taste like mangoes. I have a lot of this so I felt it was okay for me to, to, to grab a plant before the berries, um, you know, go out. I have access to a lot of this stuff. Now, if I did this in the fall after the plant was dormant, I could certainly chop off part of this big fat, this big part, and then plant it again, and it would spring another plant. This is one of these kind of things where you can take the tuber and chop it, and it can create other plants. But Aurelia racinosa smells so good. This I use for a stimulant, just like coffee. Um, the berries the same way. This is a magnificent plant. It's going to be a coffee substitute plus supply me with all the goodness of that nature has to offer. Now, I had to write these down so I didn't forget them. Aurelia. Aurelia racinosa. And this also covers um, wild sarsaparilla because that's also in uh, the genus Aurelia. Well, anyway, this is what it has in it. Um, just hang on because there's big words. You almost need to have a, a degree in organic chemistry along with ethnobotanical medicinal studies. 
It contains Aurelius triterpenoids or triterpenoid saponins. And, and you can look this up on your own if you want. It's just good stuff that does all sorts of things. Sterols, ditepenoids, and acetylenic lipids, which those are the fatty acids. They're not going to be soluble in the hot water I make my coffee substitute from. But if I was to do a tincture, I'd get those fatty acids. And fatty acids can do amazing things as far as like uh, fighting free radicals and fighting cancers, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, this is a quote I found on a, a actually a pharmaceutical website. Many of the biologically active components found in the genus Aurelia have been evaluated for their potential as lead comp compounds for drug discoveries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some cases, medicinal plants, when you read them, the placebo effect. In others, they contain strong compounds. Um, these are relatively safe. These are relatively safe. The Aurelia racinosa, the American Spike Nard, and the chicory. There's others like bloodroot that do things. St. John's wort, in some cases, you know, antidepressant, anti-anxiety, can interfere with heart medication. Um, but I would put these into the class that generally... If you use them and you maybe dose yourself a little too high, you're not going to die. Same way with blue vervain. Yes, actual effective compounds, if you take too much of it, you might break out in rashes or get nausea, but neither one are fatal conditions. And so if you want to go with this for congestion, you know, you're constantly sick, bronchitis, you feel like you have walking pneumonia, you don't give it a try. If you're that bad where you're dragging around and you become unconscious, you don't see a doctor. But in some cases, you can treat yourself. If you are careful with measurements and you find it, oh my gosh, I just got rashes, back off a little bit. You will survive. And with that, oh, a little tidbit. Yes, I'm doing the column in Primitive Archer, and I'm not plugging it because I'm in it now. You know, I'm going to be there whether or not everyone that should subscribe subscribes. Uh, I'm doing it because it's a, an amazing magazine and it's well worth it. But in this column that's coming out next, Sweetgrass is in this one, uh, I, I talk about a little bit the name Medicine Man. And it could have its roots, crows are going goofy, in the anglicizing of, of native language, native words. And so, medicine man, midowen, medicine man, midowen, midowen, uh, midday is uh, like uh, spirituality, mystery, the, the medicine, I'm going to skip and use the Anglo word here, the medicine, the midday of healing mind, body, spirit, and as far as the, the, the mind and the spirit, you know. Um, cleansing areas, um, healing in certain ways. If you were just simply um, healing the body, mishkiki, that's what it would be. It wouldn't necessarily be medicine man. Mishkiki, healing the physical body. Um, in most cases, I'm suspecting that mishkiki and midwin were the same people. You know, they healed the physical body, they healed the spiritual part of it. And now with that, I'm going to go, I'm going to prepare my plants, I'm going to finish unwinding that. I'm going to prepare for the day. It is not 10 o'clock yet. The gates are not open. It's a lovely time of the morning when I have the most amazing backyard to myself before we invite the visitors in. Have a great day and thank you for watching and I hope that your workshop is covered with Osas shavings. I shouldn't be like that. Wood shavings for making bows. Maybe some plant life that's hanging from the rafters drying. Adieu. Have a good one. And uh, thank you for your subscribership. John out.